Hello all, so this kind of carries on from what we were doing last video uh, when we were talking about confidence intervals. And if you remember in the last video, we kind of talked through the basic idea of what a confidence interval basically was. Okay, and the idea was that if you took um, sort of a number of samples, so n equals, I don't know, 100 samples, let's say, and then you took the mean of all of those samples, so you obtained um, a mean value, then the idea was you should be able to use this data, you should be able to use this evidence, information, whatever you want to call it, to construct what's known as a confidence interval for the mean, for the true population mean. In other words, you're saying, well, look, this is what the mean of these 100 samples is. I know then with some level of confidence, and we call that the confidence level, for example, 95% confident, that um, the mean is going to lie, the true population mean is going to lie somewhere between these two values. So the true population mean is going to lie somewhere between these two values with, let's say, you know, some level of confidence, 95%, 99%, whatever you want to do. Okay, and we discussed the fact that if you make this bigger, you also make the confidence interval bigger because fairly obviously the wider you make the confidence interval the more chance there is of the true population mean actually being in here um, and we also talked about the fact that if you increase n so if you increase n you can make these things smaller okay we also talked about the fact that m so m in this case is just really um, a measure okay so m is this way and this way so it's a metric so same value each side um, m is just really a measure for how much you have to add on or subtract from the sample mean um, in order to find 95% uh, confidence that your true population mean will lie in this interval here. And if you remember, m was calculated by um, some sort of measure of standard deviation, okay, so some unit of standard deviation. So I'm just going to put that as z star, okay, so z star there just means a unit of standard deviation, okay, which is determined by the confidence level, and you then multiply that by the standard error, okay, so sigma over root n. Okay, and we talked through where this formula came from and why it makes sense in the last video. But in this video, I just want to sort of do a slight adaptation of this, um, which is, well, what happens if you have quite a small sample? Or what happens if you don't know what the, uh, what the true standard deviation is? And the answer to that is not to use this distribution. So, so far, we've been using Z. OK, which corresponds to a normal distribution. So Z value, remember, corresponds to a normal distribution. So that's everything that we've been using up until now. But my question is, what if we don't take enough samples? Because sometimes the data just simply isn't there to take loads and loads of samples. So we have to we have to kind of um, make an account for that. Um, Likewise, perhaps we don't know what the population standard deviation is. We don't know what the population standard deviation is. Well, we just have to do a kind of penalty, if you like. Um, and the answer is we use a T distribution. OK, so this is a T distribution, which we give um, T is the statistic which we use. OK, now we're going to use T and Z uh, in this course. There are other types of distributions. There's like the F distribution, there's the U distribution. There's lots of different other distributions. But in this course, only worry about these two. Now, OK, so we're familiar with this. But what's this got to do with anything? Well, the truth is these two things are pretty much the same thing. OK, um, they follow the same shape. So they follow this kind of same shape, so the same normal distribution curve, which we all kind of know and love. Okay, so they all follow this kind of shape, both the T and the Z distribution. The only difference is, if you don't have enough samples, okay, so we say, if N is less than or equal to 30, so in other words, if you have less than 30, uh, in fact, no, just greater than or equal to 30, okay? So in other words, if you have less than 30 samples, then you have to use a T distribution. So if the answer to this is no, in other words, you don't have 30 or more samples, then you have to use a T distribution. OK, the other sort of thing which you have to consider. So even if you have 30 or more samples, you have to look at the population standard deviation. Do you know, are you confident enough to say that the population standard deviation is this? If the answer is yes, OK, so is sigma known? And you notice that I'm using sigma to mean the population standard deviation rather than a sample standard deviation. If this is not known, then you have to use a t-distribution. 
If it is known, then you can get away with a Z distribution. Okay, so this is really just a quick check that you need to do. First of all, is N greater than or equals 30? Do you have 30 or more samples? Have you collected enough data? If you haven't, that's okay, because sometimes it's not possible to collect loads and loads of samples. Um, but if you haven't, it's still okay, you just have to use a T distribution. Okay, But even if you do have 30 or more samples, you then have to check, are you confident? Do you know what the population standard deviation is? If you do, then you can get away with using the Z distribution. If not, then you have to use this T distribution. Okay. Now, like I say, the T distribution and the normal distribution are pretty much the same thing. It's just T is kind of a much flatter normal distribution curve. It's kind of taking into account that your standard error is a lot bigger. Okay. So it just allows you to kind of work with this. Now, the only real parameter of a T distribution is the degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go into too much what the degrees of freedom are. Okay. Um, but essentially, if you kind of want just a quick kind of something to take away, oh, this is kind of what the degrees of freedom do. Um, it's essentially the number of things that you need to know in order to know everything about the situation. So kind of as an example, um, if you sort of have a look, so I've got kind of a battery to hand, okay? Now I've obviously got two hands, okay? Now if I kind of put the battery in one of these hands and you say, right, I'm gonna open one of these hands, then um, at the moment I have two things in my kind of um, system, okay? I've got two hands. So the battery could either be in the right hand or in my left hand. Now the thing is, as soon as you open one hand, you know everything that you need about this situation because the battery has to be in one of the two hands, right? So if you know one thing, you know the battery's got to be in the other, okay? Um, kind of another situation which you could have for degrees of freedom, let's say, you might have seen this before, let's say I've got three cups, okay? So I'm just going to draw three cups here, and um, the three cups are going to be put on table, and they're a completely opaque cup, so I can't see through them, and let's say I put a ball under one of the cups, okay? Well, in this case, I have one, two, three things in my system. So if you like, N is three, okay? Um, but you notice that if I know what's underneath the first cup, that's not enough to know what's going on with the rest of the situation. I don't know everything because the ball could either still be here or here, okay? But as soon as I know what's happening underneath another cup, so as soon as I know two cups, I know everything about the situation. So if it's not here, it's not here, it has to be here. And I don't even have to consider that last situation. So that's why the degrees of freedom is always n minus one. It's always the, the number of things that you need to know before you know everything about the situation. But just take away from this that the degrees of freedom is n minus one. It's basically the number of things, the so degrees, which are allowed to change, which are free to change, okay? So this is really the main parameter, which is different from the normal distribution and the T distribution. Um, but essentially everything else works in the same way, okay? So if you go back to calculating M, so this is for a Z distribution, this is using the normal distribution that we are used to using, okay? If instead you kind of do this quick check down here and if uh, either N is less than 30 or if you don't know the population standard deviation, then you have to switch to this T distribution. But the way which you calculate M, the thing which you have to add on or subtract each time, is very simple, okay? Instead of looking at a Z value, instead of looking at the Z tables, you have to look at the T tables instead, okay? And I will show you examples of how to use this in the classes, okay? But essentially, uh, it's similar kind of thing. You just look it up in the tables, and this is just really a measure of the number of standard deviations away from the mean. Okay, and then you have to multiply by, okay, well you can either multiply by sigma over root n if you know what sigma is, but if n is less than 30, or if you don't know what sigma is, then you can always find it by taking the standard deviation of the sample which you've looked at. So it's going to be s over root n. So you notice kind of a little bit of difference here, and I've already summed this up before, but I'll do it again here, okay. If you're looking at the mean, okay, you can either look at the sample the sample mean or the population mean. Now, usually we kind of try to estimate what the population mean is. That's what we're doing here, okay? But the notation we use for each of these things, if it's the sample mean, we tend to go X bar or Y bar or whatever your random variable is, um, bar. If it's the population, we use the Greek letter M, which is mu, okay? Now, if you're working with standard deviation, okay, the sample standard deviation, we give the letter S, 
and the population standard deviation, we give the letter sigma, the Greek letter S. Okay, so just bear in mind the differences between this notation. Um, but really, what it means for confidence intervals, not a lot. Okay, you just have to do this kind of quick check down here, this sort of quick check down here. Is n less than 30? Um, if it is, then you have to use the t-distribution. Uh, and even if, it's, if it is greater than or equal to 30, then you have to check the population standard deviation. Do you know that? If the answer is no, you have to use a t-distribution. If the answer is yes, then you can stick with the z-distribution. Okay, so just make sure that this is kind of clear in your head, clear in your head. And again, we're gonna look at examples of doing this, but really the way which you work it out is exactly the same. You've just gotta be aware of the two different distributions you can use, either the z-distribution or the t-distribution.